Well, good evening and welcome to Wednesday in the Word, the weekly online study of the Bible hosted by Lebanon Rock Church. I'm Pastor Matt Skiles. I want to thank you for joining with me on this Wednesday, March the 16th, 2022, as we are continuing our current lesson series on the book of Hebrews with the theme of Let Us Go On to Perfection in Jesus Christ. We are going to be in lesson number eight tonight, studying on the better sanctuary and looking at Hebrews chapter 9. So as always, I want to encourage you to make sure that you brought your Bible with you or your tablet or your smartphone, whatever your Bible app is that you're using tonight. I'm sure it's going to be more than helpful and more than useful for tonight's study. And of course, if you brought something to drink, Pastor Matt made a quick stop at Starbucks before he got here uh, to begin tonight's study. So uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I just want you to make yourself comfortable and uh, settle in as we get into a very, very, very good topic uh, here in Hebrews chapter 9. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right into this evening's lesson. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to once again come together to study this wonderful book of Hebrews, to look at this wonderful epistle letter that was written by the writer of Hebrews to the church. Father, we pray that you'll give your word free course in our hearts and in our lives. Father, we ask that you will just anoint the teacher that brings the message. We pray that the lesson would have free course and that the lesson would touch hearts and lives. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together in this online study and to study the word of God. For we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So bless our study this evening. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, if you have your Bibles, go with me, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter 9. Now, we've been talking about how Christ, Jesus, who is our apostle and high priest, uh, is greater not only than the angels, greater than the prophets, is also greater than Moses, and also a greater high priest than Aaron. And we've been focusing on the thought of how Jesus is a greater high priest than Aaron for many different reasons. And tonight we're going to look at why Jesus is a better high priest than Aaron, because he is the high priest of a better sanctuary. And, and the Christian, by way of introduction, is a citizen of really two worlds. There's the earthly and the heavenly. And the Christian believer, uh, obviously we know as Americans, we have to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. That's what Jesus told us in Matthew 22 and verse number 21. And because we are a citizen of the two worlds, we must learn how to walk by faith in a world that is governed by sight. And like Moses, a believer must see the invisible if we are to overcome the pull of the world. And we'll talk about that in Hebrews 11 uh, coming up in a few weeks. Now, practical man says seeing is believing. That's the mindset of our culture today. But the man of faith says believing is seeing. This principle of faith must apply to our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the heavenly sanctuary. We have never seen heaven. We've never seen the heavenly sanctuary. But yet we believe what the Bible says about it. And we realize that God is not worshipped today in temples that are made with hands, as we heard in Acts chapter 7, verses 46 through 50. There is no special place on earth where God dwells. We may call a local church building a house of God, but we know that God does not live <laughs> there. Uh, the building is dedicated to God in his service, but it is not his dwelling place. Hebrews 9 presents a detailed contrast between the Old Covenant sanctuary and, and the tabernacle and the temple and the New Covenant heavenly sanctuary where Jesus Christ now ministers. And the contrast makes it clear that the New Covenant sanctuary is superior because we know that, that Christ dwells in our hearts and we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which dwells in us. So the Old Testament sanctuary and the Old Testament tabernacle and temple that we studied and we've looked at in previous uh, lesson series, most notably in Galatians, and now also here in Hebrews, what we've discovered is that the Old Testament law uh, does not compare to the New Testament, New Covenant that God has with us. 
as Christian believers. So we're going to look um, tonight at why the new covenant sanctuary or the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus Christ dwells is superior to the old, uh, to the Old Testament sanctuary. And so we want to look at point number one tonight, and that is the inferior old covenant sanctuary. So let's go to Hebrews 9. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And we read it here in the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to look verses 1 through 10. Now, we've got a lot of scripture here to cover tonight, so we want to try to stay right with that, okay? So Hebrews Chapter number nine, let's begin reading at verse number one. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now the writer of Hebrews reminds the readers, these Christians that are reading the letter of the regulations, the rituals and the practices in the tabernacle and, and how they were ordained of God. And if there was any inferiority in the tabernacle service, it was not because God had not established the ritual. So um, while the old covenant was in force, the ministry of the priests was ordained by God and was perfectly proper in the eyes of God. What was it then that made that tabernacle inferior? Well, there's five answers to that question here in this first point. Uh, one of the reasons why it was inferior is because, first of all, it was an earthly sanctuary. You notice verse number one there at Hebrews 9 says, Then verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So that means it was made by man and pitched by man. The Jewish people generously brought their gifts to Moses, and from those materials of gold and bronze and, and all the all the treasures that were brought, the, the tabernacle was constructed. Then God gave spiritual wisdom and skill uh, to Bezael and, and, and Oliab uh, to do the intricate work of making the various parts of the tabernacle and its furnishings. And you can read about that in Exodus chapter 35 and 36. After the construction was completed, the sanctuary was put in place and dedicated to God in Exodus chapter 40. Even though the glory of God moved into the sanctuary, that is the Holy of Holies, it was still an earthly building constructed by human beings out of earthly materials. So being an earthly building, it had several weaknesses. For one thing, it would need a certain amount of repair. Also, uh, it was limited geographically. Uh, if it was pitched in one place, it could not be in another place. It had to be dismantled and the various parts carried from place to place. And as the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness and uh, walked and traveled, the tabernacle would be broken down, taken apart, and would be uh, set up again uh, at the next spot where they camped and where they were located. And so it belonged to the nation of Israel as well, and not to the whole world. So that tabernacle was just for Israel, just for 
the Jewish people, no one else. And that's why we read that and you see how there is an earthly sanctuary made by human beings with human hands. Another reason why the tabernacle is inferior, the old covenant sanctuary is inferior, is because it, it was a type and shadow of something greater. If you look at verses 2 through 5 of Hebrews chapter 9, the writer says, For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table, and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies. Verse 4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubs of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So the writer here begins to list all the various furnishings and elements and parts of the tabernacle because each one of those uh, each one of those uh, furnishings and each one of those parts of the sanctuary uh, had a special meaning. Uh, they were patterns of things in the heavens, as Hebrews 9 and 23 says, and we'll talk about that shortly here. So the phrase, the first in Hebrews 9 and 2, and the second in Hebrews 9 and 7 refer to the, the first and second divisions of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent, uh, and then as you walked in, there was there was one part that was the sanctuary. Then you went into the second part, which was the Holy of Holies. And the high priest was only allowed to go in there once a year. He was only allowed to go in there once a year. Um, and so the first was called the holy place. The second was called the holy of holies. Now the sanctuary or the holy place was where the priest would minister. Each of these division, divisions or these rooms or sections of the tabernacle and later the temple, they each had furnishings and pieces of furniture that had their own special meaning. In the holy place, which was the sanctuary, stood the seven-branded golden lampstick, candlestick lampstand. And, and lampstand was, would be the term that I would, would, would use because the light was produced by the burning of wicks and oil, not by the use of candles. And since there were no windows in the tabernacle, that lampstand, that candlestick lampstand, provided the necessary light for the priests ministering in the holy place. The nation of Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. And, and Jesus Christ is the light of the world, as he said in John 8 and 12. And believers are to shine as lights in the world, as Philippians 2, 14 and 15 tell us. There was also a table in the holy place or in the sanctuary with 12 loaves of bread on it. It was called the table of showbread. Now, each Sabbath, the priests would remove the old loaves and put fresh loaves on the table, and the old loaves would be eaten. These loaves were called the bread of presence, and the table was called the table of presence. Only the priests could eat the bread, and they were required to eat it in the sanctuary. It reminded the 12 tribes of God's presence that sustained them. It also speaks to us today of Jesus Christ, the bread of life given to the whole world. The golden altar stood in the holy place just in front of the veil that divided the two parts of the tabernacle. The word translated censer, a device for burning incense, should be called altar. Now, the golden altar did not stand in the Holy of Holies, but its ministry pertained to the Holy of Holies. In what way? On the annual Day of Atonement, the high priest used coals from this altar to burn incense before the mercy seat within the veil. And that's found in Leviticus 16. And, and we read here, Moses related the golden altar to the Ark of the Covenant. And so did the author of 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 22. Each morning and evening, a priest burned incense on this altar 
David suggested that it is a picture of prayer ascending to God in Psalm 141 and verse 2. Now, it can be a reminder that Jesus Christ intercedes for us, as Romans 8, 33, 34 says. You know, and, and so, and, and also I want to say, if you want more details about the incense altar, you can just go to the 30th chapter and the 37th chapter of the book of Exodus, and that explains it in more detail. Uh, but the incense itself is described in the 30th chapter of Exodus. And the Holy of Holies contained the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden chest, three feet, nine inches long, two feet, three inches wide, and two feet, three inches high. And on top of the chest was a beautiful mercy seat made of gold with angels or cherubims at each end, and they were bowed and their wings were touching one another. This was the throne of God in the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 20, and in Psalm 80 and in Psalm 99. On the Day of Atonement, one day a year, uh, the blood was sprinkled on this mercy seat to cover the tables of the law within the ark. God did not look at the broken law. He saw the blood. Christ is our mercy seat, to put it in a New Testament uh, uh, application here. But his blood does not just cover sin. It takes sin away. So no doubt about it, there's many spiritual truths wrapped up in these pieces of furniture, and all of them are of great eternal, spiritual, and intrinsic value to God. But the most important truth in this, all of this was symbolism and not the spiritual reality. Let me say that again. The most important truth is this, all of this that we have just spoken of, the tabernacle, the holy place, or the sanctuary, the holy of holies, where you see the lampstand, you see the altar of incense, you see uh, the burning of incense, you see the Ark of the Covenant that is within the holy of holies. All of those were symbols and not the spiritual reality. It was this fact that made the tabernacle of the old covenant inferior. Not only that, but our third, our third answer to why the old covenant sanctuary was inferior is it was inaccessible to the people. In verse 9, in Hebrews 9, verse 6 and 7 of Hebrews 9, the writer says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So we must not get the idea here that the Jews assembled in the tabernacle and later in the temple for worship. The priests and the Levites were permitted into the tabernacle precincts or sections or, 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 or parts of the, of the tabernacle and sanctuary, but not the people from the other tribes. Furthermore, Though the priests ministered in the holy place day after day, only the high priest, once a year, entered into the Holy of Holies. And, and when he did that, he had to offer a sacrifice for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Now, in contrast, the heavenly tabernacle where Jesus dwells is open to all of the people of God and at all times. That's why Hebrews 4 and 16 says, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. We don't have to feel like we're restricted or we are uh, unable to enter in. I, I, uh, I can only imagine when Jesus died on the cross and the veil in the temple was torn in two, that was God's way of signifying tangibly, physically, in a earthly sense that my son has accomplished the finished work of atonement. He has made atonement for the sins of all mankind. His sins did not just cover, uh, or his blood did not just cover our sins. Excuse me, I got ahead of myself there. 
Jesus' blood did not just cover our sins, it took away our sins. That's the reality that we have here. That's why the Old Testament sanctuary was inaccessible to people. Only to the Levitical priests and to the high priests. That was it. All the other tribes, people, and 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 members of the tribes and 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 the people of God and people of Israel, all the Jews were not allowed to, to, to be a part of that. And so there was no accessibility there. A fourth reason why the uh, Old Testament sanctuary is inferior is that it was temporary. It wasn't forever. Hebrews 9 and 8 says, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The fact that the outer court, or the first tabernacle, uh, was standing was proof that God's work of salvation for man had not yet been completed. The outer court stood between the people in the Holy of Holies. As long as the priests were ministering in the holy place, the way had not yet been opened into the presence of God. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to bottom, and the way was opened into the Holy of Holies. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 27, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 27, and find verse number 50. I'll give you a second to find that. Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to read verses 50 all the way down to verse 54. And I love what this says. And this is the, uh, the account by Matthew of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I want you to pay close attention to what happens after Christ died. Matthew 27 and verse 50. We're going to read down to verse 54. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. That means he has died. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, or two, from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. You notice that Jesus in Matthew 27 and verse 50 died on the cross. Now he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He also cried out, I thirst. Uh, he also cried out uh, at the very end, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He cried that out, as Matthew tells us in Matthew 27. He cried with a loud voice, and then he said, It is finished. That's the last recorded words of Jesus on the cross, and then he bowed his head and he died. So what Matthew records in Matthew 27 and verse 50 is that when Jesus had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. So he had cried out, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he said those very three famous words, it is finished. And then he died. And then it tells us in verse 51, this great story. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain or cut in two from top to bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So it was a great earthquake, and obviously darkness had covered the land, um, and there was a great earthquake, and the veil in the temple was torn in two. Why did that happen? Why was the veil in the temple torn in two? The veil was the covering into the Holy of Holies because no longer, no longer was man uh, going to be kept from having access to the throne of God. That was God's way of saying, my son has accomplished this. Now you can come to me freely. We no longer have a need for the Holy of Holies. Um, anybody that is an unbeliever, even a sinner that cries out for salvation and calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Why? Because they can come boldly before the throne of God. So this, this sanctuary was temporary. 
it was temporary. It wasn't permanent. What Jesus did on the cross was permanent. It was eternal and it was forever. And it was accomplishing all of God's will and all of God's plan of redemption. It was all encompassed in Jesus Christ when he died on the cross and when he rose again on the third day. And another reason why this Old Testament sanctuary is, is inferior is because its ministry was external, not internal. And in Hebrews 9, verses 9 and 10, it says, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now, the sacrifices that were offered and the blood that was sprinkled to the mercy seat could never change the heart or the conscience of a worshiper. All of the ceremonies and rituals associated with the tabernacle had to do with ceremonial purity, not moral purity. These were carnal ordinances uh, that pertain to the outer man, but could not change the inner man. All of this was man-made. Uh, the blood that was sprinkled, um, you know, the, the priest going in once a year into the Holy of Holies. All that blood could do was cover the sin. It couldn't take it away. And it did nothing to purge the conscience. It did nothing to cleanse the heart. It did nothing to change us internally. It was all an external ministry that dealt with the outward man, not with the inward man. And so that's why it's so important that we understand that the Old Testament sanctuary was inferior. That is not to demean uh, the importance of the tabernacle and later the temple. Again, they were all types and shadows that pointed the way to the cross. And Jesus said again, think not that I've come to destroy the law, but rather to fulfill it. That's Jesus's whole mission on this earth. Uh, he said, the son of man hath come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's so important. That's what Jesus came to do, to seek and to save that which was lost, to fulfill his Father's will and to complete God's plan of redemption. It could not be done in the Old Testament sanctuary of the tabernacle, later the temple, because it was inferior. So let's move on to point number two, and that is the superior heavenly sanctuary. So let's begin reading at verse number 11, and we're going to take it all the way through to the end of the chapter. So. So Hebrews chapter 9, let's begin reading at verse 11. We're going to take it all the way to verse number 28. But Christ being come in a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all, while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. 
It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. A lot of scripture there to cover, but there's five deficiencies that we looked at uh, of the old covenant sanctuary. And now we line them up with the five superiorities of the new covenant sanctuary. Because we looked at point number one uh, about the, the Old Testament sanctuary being inferior. Now we're looking at point two at the heavenly sanctuary being superior, and it is. And the reason why is we have five reasons for why the heavenly sanctuary is superior to the Old Testament sanctuary. First of all, it is heavenly. If you look at verse number 11, you see very, very quickly there, uh, in verse number 11, uh, it says, But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So the writer emphasizes this fact before because he wanted his readers to focus their attention uh, on the things of heaven, not on the things of the earth. And some things on earth, including the beautiful Jewish temple, would soon be destroyed. But the heavenly realities would endure forever. The old covenant tabernacle was made by the hands of men, as we talked about. The new covenant heavenly sanctuary was not made with hands. Not of this building, as Hebrews 9 and 11 says, which means it's not of the earth's creation. The heavenly tabernacle needed no such materials like we see in the Old Testament sanctuary. Since the heavenly tabernacle does not belong to creation, it's free of the ravages of time. It's eternal. It is a heavenly sanctuary. And, and really, if you think about it, the tabernacle of the Old Testament was patterned after the sanctuary in heaven. But we no longer need the pattern. We have the eternal reality. So the first reason why the heavenly sanctuary is superior to the Old Testament sanctuary is because it's heavenly. It's not made with hands. Secondly, uh, the Heavenly sanctuary is superior because its ministry is effective in dealing with sin. Now, we have a series of contrasts that show again the superiority of the heavenly ministry. First of all, in verse 12, you see the sacrifices of animals versus the sacrifice of Christ. In verse 12, it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, that being Jesus, he entered and once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So the writer here shows that how, you know, that, that how these animal sacrifices were inferior. And we're going to look more at that in, in chapter 10 next week. Jesus Christ and his sacrifice is far superior to the blood of goats and bulls and, and lambs and sheep and animals. Because the blood of an animal could never solve the problem of humans and their sins. Jesus Christ became a man that he might be able to die for the sins of mankind. His death was voluntary. It is doubtful that any Old Testament sacrifice ever volunteered for the job. I doubt very seriously that any animal wanted to be killed. 
But an animal's blood was carried by the high priest into the Holy of Holies. But Jesus Christ presented himself in the presence of God as the final and complete sacrifice for sins. Of course, the animal sacrifices were repeated over and over and over and over. Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, offered himself once. And also, no animal sacrifice ever purchased eternal redemption. As I said time and time again in this lesson so far, the blood of these animals can only cover sin until the time when Christ's blood would take away sin. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, we read where John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Um, and that's what Jesus did. We have eternal redemption. It's not conditioned on our merits or our good works, but it is secured through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Also, a second reason why we see the, the ministry was effective in dealing uh, with sin, the, the heavenly sanctuary, is because the ceremonial cleansing versus the cleansing of conscience. Verse 13 and 14 says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we see there where he's saying that if the blood of these animals, you know, um, could, could sanctify the purifying of our flesh, how much more is the blood of Jesus going to do? Because Christ accomplished the eternal redemption. As I said again, all the blood of these animals did was just cover sin. Jesus took it away. So the writer's saying if the blood of, of, as he said there, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh. He said if that could just ceremonially, ceremonially make us clean, how much more greater is the blood of Jesus going to accomplish that? That's what it is. You know, the Holy Spirit does the work. The Holy Spirit does the work. And so not only are we washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and our, clean, and our sins are forgiven and we are cleansed and purified, but it is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost of God, that continues to cleanse and purge our conscience. That's why it's so important we understand that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are made holy by God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are given that, that righteousness is imputed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're made righteous through his blood, and we're cleansed and made whole. But the Holy Spirit can cleanse our conscience through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And also we see here, Another reason why, again, the ministry of the heavenly tabernacle is effective in dealing with sin is because we have temporary blessings versus eternal blessings. Now, the blessings under the old covenant depended on the obedience of God's people. If they obeyed God, uh, he blessed him. If they disobeyed, he withheld his blessings. Not only were the blessings temporary, but they were primarily physical, rain, bumper crops, protection from enemies and sickness and, and disease and so on and so forth. Israel's inheritance in Canaan involved material blessing. Our eternal inheritance is primarily spiritual in nature. And it's important a believer can have confidence because all that we have is in Christ and it is eternal. It's important that we understand that we have eternal blessings. We are blessed in this world in this life, but also in the life to come. My father, who was a pastor for many, many years, would often preach and share uh, that systematic faithfulness was the key to God's blessings here on earth. If we obey God's word and we honor God and we are, are faithful to God, systematically faithful means that it's, it's a consistent spiritual faithful, godly Christian life. If we do that, we will see the blessings of God. My dad preached about tithing and giving to God. He honored God his whole life. 
uh, that that is passed on to me. Uh, my my father spoke highly of prayer and fasting, which I do. There is something to be said for living a godly and faithful life. But on top of that, he would also say, I'm not only thankful for the blessings that God has given me in this earthly life, but I'm thankful for the blessings in the life to come because there is eternal blessings. The children of Israel could only rely on the temporary blessings that God had given them. It was an inheritance. The land of Canaan flowing with milk and honey, that was their inheritance. Everything with the children of Israel, with the Old Testament sanctuary, with the tabernacle, later the temple, and the Levitical law of God, which we've been talking about throughout this lesson series in Hebrews, was based on temporary earthly blessings, all part of God's covenant with Israel. Jesus fulfilled the law, completed the covenant relationship. He was the king of the Jews. He came unto his own, his own knew him not, but yet he still died for the sins of mankind. Therefore, the old Testament sanctuary is in fear because the heavenly sanctuary, where Jesus Christ now dwells, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, our great apostle and high priest, as he's described, is there in a heavenly sanctuary, which gives us eternal blessings, which will be ours someday. But while we're on this earth and we're laboring for the Lord and we're serving the Lord, if we will honor him and be faithful to him, we'll see that blessing in our life. That's the beauty of being a child of God and a New Testament believer and a Christian. It's because you have blessings in this life, but also in the life to come. And the third reason why um, the heavenly sanctuary uh, is superior is its ministry is based on a costly sacrifice. I don't have to go into a lot of detail here other than to tell you uh, very, very clearly that Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. And, and you know, it's important. I want to read verses 23 all the way down uh, to verse 25 as we continue. And the writer of Hebrews says, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, into heaven itself, to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood for others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The ministry of the heavenly tabernacle is based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews in these verses of Scripture was saying, that it, Jesus does not have to go in to the Holy of Holies often, once a year, as the, as the high priest used to do. The reason for that is because he died once and for all for the sins of mankind, and he took away the sin. So it's no longer necessary. It's no longer needed. And he cannot, he went into the, uh, into the holy place. He went into the holy place. Um, before God. That's why he's our great mediator. He's our great intercessor. And so the reason why the heavenly sanctuary is so superior is because it's based on a costly sacrifice. It cost Jesus everything. It cost Jesus everything. You know, when I murmur and grumble and complain sometimes when God wants me to do things, uh, I'm reminded of a situation that happened to me Years ago, when I was first called to the ministry in 1990, in January of 1991, I, I felt the call of God to the ministry. I was a, a 19, almost 20-year-old kid, and I wrestled with that. I didn't want to do it. Uh, when God called me to be a pastor, called me to be a minister, I, I thought, this is, this, is, this is crazy. And I remember I was in the middle of a three-day fast. I was fasting and praying, and I remember that... Um, 
in, in that time of prayer and fasting, I was really wrestling. I was telling God that I wanted to, that I would, I was telling God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. My, 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 my lips were saying, my voice was saying, but my heart was really not in it. Uh, I was wrestling. Um, and I remember very clearly the Lord spoke to my heart by the Holy Spirit and said, Matthew, I gave my life. I gave my blood. I gave myself as a sacrifice for you. It's not too much to ask for you to give me your life in return. And you talk about a humbling experience. And every time that I, I think that something's beneath me or I think that something is, is, is out of my realm of ability or expertise, I go back to that, that time, that place and time in the winter of 1991 when the Lord said, Matthew, I gave my life for you. I gave my blood for you. I gave my, I gave my, I gave my body as a sacrifice for you. So it's not too much to ask for you to give me your life in return. And the reason why I feel like that I can answer the call to ministry and be a servant to the Lord is because this heavenly sanctuary is superior because it's all based on a costly sacrifice. It costs Jesus everything to purchase our salvation. Now think about that for a second, okay? And also, fourthly, another Another reason why the heavenly sanctuary is superior is because its ministry is final and complete. And, and, and there's nothing temporary or incomplete about that. If you look at verses 25 through 28, and I just read it there a moment ago, um, where it says in verse 25, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. Well, then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That tells us right there all we need to know. But then it goes on in verse 27. Not too many people like this verse. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them all look that looked for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. There's nothing incomplete or temporary about the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. What he came to do, he accomplished. Everything Jesus was sent to this earth to do, he fulfilled. That's why he was able to bow his head and say, it is finished. He accomplished his Father's will. And his completed work on the cross was complete. And now he is ministering in heaven on our behalf. He is not only uh, there interceding for us, but because he died, he put away sin by dying on the cross. And now he is appearing, uh, he's appearing in heaven as our, as our advocate with the Father, as our, and making intercession for us. And not only that, but he, what he did was final. End of it. I use a phrase a lot of times when I'm talking to people, when I want to bring a point home, I will tell them, um, you know, you, you don't have to doubt God's word because the issue, because the issue is, you know, the issue is not in doubt. You know, the issue is not in doubt with God. I always use that term. The issue is not in doubt with God uh, and his word, because there shouldn't be an issue when you're talking about the truth of God's word. God's word, the Bible that we preach and the Bible that we, that we espouse and preach and teach what we're doing here each 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 week on Wednesday in the Word is conveying the truth of the Word of God. The issue should never be in doubt, and so you should never question whether or not what God's Word says is true. Jesus died on the cross; He is now seated at the right hand of the Father in a heavenly sanctuary. It is superior to all the earthly Old Testament sanctuaries of the temple and the tabernacle because it is final and complete. It's done. There's nothing else that Jesus has to do. And with that in view, and knowing that to be true, then we can thank God for knowing that we have a great high priest because he serves in a better sanctuary. So in conclusion, after reading this ninth chapter, um, 
that the Hebrew Christians had received uh, from the writer of Hebrews. We're reading chapter 9. This is a portion of the letter that they read. I'm quite sure they had to realize there's no middle ground. They had to make a choice between the earthly or the heavenly, the temporary or the eternal, the incomplete or the complete. So, you know, you know, the thing is, some of them probably thought, well, why not return to the temple, but also try to practice my Christian faith? Why not have the best of both worlds? I'm sure some of those Hebrew Christians probably were like some of the Judaizers of the early church that tried to hang on to some of the old aspects of the law and try to have the best of both worlds. But that's the, the reason why they couldn't do that was because that would be compromising and refusing to go, um, you know, refusing to, to go all in uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no middle way here. The believer's sanctuary is in heaven. Our Father is in heaven. Our Savior is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And the treasures that we receive will be in heaven. And this hope that you and I have is a heavenly hope. So a true Christian believer can walk by faith and not by sight. No matter what's going to happen on this earth, we can be confident as Christians that everything is settled in heaven. Praise God for that. So bow your heads with me as we close with the word of prayer and bring our study uh, this evening to an end. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity that we've had uh, to come together here on this Wednesday night and to study this great lesson from the book of Hebrews. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior who died on the cross for our sins, gave himself a ransom for many, completed your work and plan of redemption and atonement, and is now seated at the right hand of your throne in heaven. Father, help us to remember that there is a heavenly sanctuary. Our home is in heaven, and that we have the rewards waiting for us because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's no middle ground. There's no middle of the road. We must serve you faithfully and walk completely with you. Uh, Father, we pray that you'll bless us the remainder of this week. We ask you to be with us as we continue through our week, prosper and keep us in health, even as our soul prospers. Father, we pray for the hostilities and the uh, issues in Ukraine with the Russians and Ukrainians at war right now. We pray for peace, and we pray, God, that you'll bring uh, an end to that battle and to that uh, uh, conflict. Father, we pray, Lord, as well for all those here in the United States of America and in the body of Christ that have needs as well. And Father, I pray personally that you'll bless, uh, be with our church this weekend upcoming as we welcome the uh, Kellys and Wondrous Grace Ministries for our Revival Conference 2022. May the services be blessed and may your presence be strong. And Father, bless us now as we dismiss from this place of study, but not your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you again for being with us. And uh, just a quick reminder that this coming Sunday, March the 20th, uh, we'll begin our Revival Conference 2022. We will be in services in our in-person gatherings with Marcus and Loretta Kelly and Wondrous Grace Ministries. Uh, you can join us 1045 on Sunday morning, 6 p.m. on Sunday night, and 7 p.m. nightly, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The dates are March the 20th through March the 23rd. You can look on our Facebook page. Also look on our on our web on our website at lebanonrockchurch.org for more information. Uh, be sure to join us if you can. If not, we will be having our online worship service as well on Sunday, uh, March the twentieth. We invite you to join us for online worship if you can't make it out for the in-person services. And be sure to join us next week as we continue with the study of Hebrews as we look at chapter ten. So from all of us here at Lebanon Rock Church, thank you for being with us. God bless you and have a wonderful day and wonderful week the remaining ahead. And we'll see you all next time.